I just want to get all these lives out of the way this morning instead of this afternoon. So um, I wanted to come here and talk about the paper towel test. Um, occasionally, most of these guys are passed away um, with the baby boomers or if you um, come from a military background, there are is the white glove test, um, which thankfully most of us don't have to pass 99% of the time. But you are going to have an individual every once in a while come out and ask you, um, can you pass the paper towel test? And it's usually, I don't know why, it's usually with a steamer. And um, a steamer is an add-on charge. So you need to make sure that if you are going to stand up to the test of time and be able to pass the white paper towel test, that you are charging extra because it's gonna take you an extra hour and a half to do um, the floors to get them in up in order so that you can pass the paper towel test. And um, so you're gonna actually have to flat mop it at least three times um, with just soap and water. And then you're gonna steam clean it and you're gonna want an actual pad for roughly every 100 square feet. And then you're gonna do the floors about three times. After you've hit the floors about five to six times, you should be able to pass the white paper towel test. So um, someone had asked me about that, I think a couple days ago and I got behind on everything I was doing. Also, I wanted to come here and talk about the code of conduct. For those of you who know or don't know, um, a code of conduct is something that I instituted in 2017 after I was punched in the face by an 84 year old man who was angry and um, basically wanted to kidnap my employee. So um, a code of conduct basically says that you, um, and they have to initial it on the paperwork, it says that you will not put up with any shenanigans. So if that person is verbally abusive and uses, you know, the F-bomb and doesn't talk to you like you're in church and um, starts to become really aggressive and then says more F-bombs, then you have every right to pull off the job and then just go home or to your next job. And then what will happen is because they've signed that clause is you just bill them for a full cleaning, the end of discussion. And they can't contest it because they signed the thing. So um, a code of conduct is really important. It actually is in my paperwork bundle. If you guys purchase that, then it, just look for the code of conduct. Um, as time becomes crazier and crazier, we're getting more and more aggressive people. And I just think it's planetary and it's just making people act out who normally wouldn't act out, I would like to believe. <laughs> but hey, you never know. And then um, I wanted to talk about bidding over the phone. So for those of you who took the Pricing Blueprint Masterclass, I hope that you um, took notes and were able to achieve. I know I touched base with a couple of you and a couple of you did attempt to do it. So yay! But um, I wanted to make sure that we're all starting to do that, um, especially with gas. I see gas hitting about four bucks a gallon by the end of the year. Um, so you're going to want to try to close them over the phone. It's just the most economical way to do it, especially with one-time cleanings. The only time I do recommend that you go in person is when you are brand spanking new and you don't know what you're doing. There are certain things that you can do. Um, I don't want to say psychologically, but there's certain nuances that you can do to kind of help you close the deal. Um, and, and that will actually help you close more deals because they can see the person. And if you're still cleaning yourself, then they're like, okay, I can trust this person. And if you're not, you can send out your lead or you can do it yourself. But um, I highly recommend that you close over the phone. And basically there is a questionnaire that I have made up. Um, and it's, it just asks, you know, you come in and you introduce yourself and you say, my, hi, my name is Shannon. I'm the owner of the maid broker. How can I help you? And they'll say, my name is Mrs. Smith and I live at 1234 Main Street. Sometimes they'll want to give you their address and other times they'll give you gray area. I actually won't deal with people who don't want to give me their address. I think that's really bizarre behavior. For you guys who live in a larger city, that might be normal behavior, but it's not for us. So I, that's a red flag for me. So I'm like, I don't want to do business with you. If you don't want to give me your address and you can't trust me, like I'm going to go do something, then you're not going to trust my helpers, right? And then you're going to give me a hard time because there's something off about the whole situation. But you're going to ask, you know, how many levels after you get the address, if you're not familiar with what it is, you can actually, if you're sitting in front of your computer, you can Google it really fast. Or you can ask pertinent questions like, you know, how many levels is your home or is it a single level home? How many people live in the home? We've had so much transition in the last 18 months. There are literally nine people living in a house where before there was only two. So you need to ask because that's going to make the house dirtier, right? 
and then you're going to ask if there are any doggies or kitties, right? So you want to know, I usually want to know if there's doggies or kitties because I don't want to let Fluffy out and have them get eaten by the coyote, right? Because that would suck. Nobody wants to have that conversation. And then I'm asking how many bathrooms they have and if they have, for here, because we didn't have any building codes, um, we a lot of homes have two kitchens. So I'm like, so there's only one kitchen, right? <laughs> so um, that's super important as well. So because a lot of times we would get surprised because we didn't have building codes. So in the 80s, if you and I wanted to build a house in my area, we didn't need a license. We didn't have to pay an impact fee. We just had to own the land and have the materials delivered and you and I could have built a house even knowing we didn't know anything. So <laughs> it's, um, it's an interesting dynamic, but times have changed. You can't do that anymore here. Um, so you, after you ask those pertinent questions, you want to ask, are there blinds that would need to be dusted each time we came? What about the ceiling fan? What about the floors? What type of flooring is it? If a house that actually has all tile is going to take longer than a house that's mostly carpeting. Um, if they have nine dogs or 10 cats, that's going to take longer and it's going to be messier and it's going to take more effort. Um, those are the questions, but most important, you want to ask about frequency. Frequency is so important. If it's just a one-time cleaning, we have a minimum charge that we charge for a one-time cleaning versus if you come in bi-weekly, which is 26 cleans, or if you come in monthly, which has to commit to 12 full cleans. And then if you um, want to be weekly, then of course that's 52 cleans. We talked a little bit about how we don't want to take on three-week clients and that's 17 cleanings. And how if you do take on a three-week client, you want to convert them to monthly after you've transitioned because maybe you just need the income. Sometimes they'll get mad at you. Sometimes they won't and they'll stick on and say, yeah, I can do monthly or they'll sign on for biweekly. And the difference between twice a month and biweekly is literally two visits. Make sure you mention that. When they say, I want someone twice a month, say, are you sure? Because biweekly service, which is every two weeks, is legitimately two more visits. It's 50 to 52. So it's um, important to know those nuances. And then after you've gotten all that information, say, well, I think it's going to be this price and you're going to give a range. And then once you get the range, you always want to go usually for the highest price after you've walked the property. Because then you, you're like, well, I don't have to go out in person. I kind of know because everybody has a generalized layout. You just, everyone just lives differently. And then that way you can have a, a range. So it gives you some elbow room. So you're not eating it on each and every cleaning and then you become resentful, right? Because there's no point in being in business unless you're making money, right? So that's important. Um, and then you're going to get, you know, their credit card information closes the deal. And I know a lot of you still don't want to do that. But when you get their credit card information, they're, you're closing the deal. They're not shopping around anymore. It's a done deal. They've already given you that information. And then you're going to put them in the computer and you're going to ask them for their email address. And the reason why you're asking for their email address is so that you can A, mail them a receipt if they want one, B, so that the digital calendar system sends them a reminder and a text message, but so that if you don't close them, that you can market to them later. That's important. So these are just some of the questions I ask when I'm doing a bid over the phone. So I hope that all of this information is helpful. And if you are a local cleaner, I am cleaning out my garage. I'm selling these for two bucks a pop and they're full. I think I have about four or five bottles left. And then Wyman's cooktop, these are two bucks a pop. Um, these, some of these are left over from Castle Keeper Cleaning. I just want them out of the garage because I'm converting my garage into an exercise room. Furniture polish, Flava for two bucks a pop. And then this one's not full, so if you want this, I'll just throw it all in. Um, other than that, if you guys have any questions, I look forward to hearing from, the, from you. And um, I actually bought a little goody tootie it's a housekeeping, housekeeping in Old Virginia. I don't know if you can see that with the sun. The winter sun is different. And it actually gives tips on house cleaning. Now, mind you, in 18, 1879, <laughs> there weren't any bathrooms in the home. So there really isn't any bathroom cleaning. And then you have to also remember that if they did have a bathroom or um, what do they used to call them? I'm sure one of you will remember and tell me. When the washroom, um, Everyone would always, if, if you were lucky to have a housekeeper, then you could have them fill up the tub several times. But typically, um, the, uh, the leader of the house got to take a tub first, and then it would just be recycled each time. So if you were little, you got the icky water. And then um, those are interesting things. But I, they, <laughs> they give the suggestion. This is pretty funny. So um, they, they talk about a top-to-bottom deluxe cleaning. 
So this particular person, and they give references and testimonials. It's always someone's initial, like Dr. Um, SJW, and you're assuming it's a woman. So um, they're giving directions on how to do a top to bottom deluxe skinny. So their method is legitimately to remove, they do one room at a time, and you remove every single item out of the room, including the carpets. And then when you want to store your carpets for um, winter or summer or whatever, you roll them up in Tabasco, Tabasco, t tobacco leaves. <laughs> so, and that helps keep the, um, the moths and stuff away, which I found pretty interesting because I would never think of tobacco leaves to be used in that way. But it was, this is Virginia, right? Because they had tobacco farms. So um, it's interesting reading and there are a ton of recipes how to make stuff. Um, typically chemicals if you need them and um, most importantly there's some really interesting recipes I'm not sure if I'll try any of them um, but it is pretty interesting reading anyway I look forward to hearing from you guys you take care